close to the camera. It's all right. We want to make sure people can see all of your features. You can see all my uh, boogers and my mustache. Yeah. <laughs> Is that where you keep them? You know, say a little <laughs> bit of not? later. Good storage. Some people are like, man, if only I could store more boogers than just in my nose. You just need to grow a mustache to have that ex auxiliary <laughs> storage facility. Yeah. Saves on having to carry around little baggies full of them. <laughs> uh, did you eat boogers as a child or as an adult? You know, no judgment. No, no. I was never really a booger eater. Uh, yeah. I was a booger flicker, you know. Yeah. Ball them up. Was it, give was them it nice... targeted booger flicking? Oh, yeah, but I wasn't very good at it. So usually it ended up back on me somehow. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, you know, I'm rubber, you are glue, bounce off you and stick on me or something like that. It, that was, yeah, that was the the rhyme on the playground. And then I'd get, and then <laughs> That's I'd what y'all say in the booger yeah. gangs growing up. <laughs> yeah. Did you line up like Civil War, take five steps, turn around and... <laughs> <laughs> booger flick. <laughs> oh, I'm hit! <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, it was mostly just the, you know, it was like I was a booger sniper. I would just, you know, hide behind somebody else at recess and then turn around the corner and flick a booger at the bully and then run. Yeah. You know, it, today, it if you did that, you, you would be arrested for an <laughs> attack with a biological weapon. I, I would, wouldn't. I? Oh, my God. You're so right. <laughs> <laughs> my how times have changed. <laughs> oh, kids can't have any fun anymore. <laughs> uh, no one can have any fun anymore. <laughs> Who are we kidding? Uh, I know. <laughs> Welcome no, to What the Hell flicking. is Water, everybody. <laughs> Uh, where we're here to brighten your days and tell you all the things you can't do. <laughs> I know. Oh, I've got more. <laughs> oh, I've got more. But wait. Uh, today is January 14th, and this is episode 72. Um, yesterday, we were talking um, about the birds and the bees. Oh, no, that was a couple of days ago. But the birds and the bees yeah, did we brought it up again. Back. Yes. Uh, Ryder did 69 me yesterday on screen. Um, so if you're wondering what that means, you'll have to go check that out. Uh, we also warned you guys about the, the, the real danger of electric cars, which is that they can be the nearly silent killer if you don't look both ways as yeah, you're crossing the street. <laughs> something that's just not talked about enough in the media. I don't know what what they were thinking, right? Uh, and I don't know why. Uh, so we also talked a little bit about the Zettelkasten method. We talked um, some about what uh, Ryder was reading, um, which Ryder, what, what was it? The name uh, of the, book the world again? beyond your head. The world beyond your head. And and yeah. Ryder was sharing with us how he's reading this book and he's trying to do something called the Zettelkasten method. And now we have Danielle joining us as well. And the Zettelkasten method um, is a way to basically link together pieces of information. And essentially, you can think of it like a bunch of note cards that you write an ID number on. You say, oh, this is ID number one, this is ID number three. And you link them together so you can say, oh, hey, I'm talking about dogs. Well, that's also related to, you know, humans. <laughs> and, and dogs are card number one. And see, see card number three to see the humans. Yeah, it, you know, or you could have multiple tags on it. So one of them is humans, the other one is loyalty or something like that because dogs are loyal. And then you look up loyalty. And if you could link all the tags you have that all have loyalty on them, then you get this kind of mishmash of kind of what you've been bumping into that deals with this concept. And so that's hopefully what happens here. The, the fascinating thing, one of the things we learned in Rome research is that oftentimes we use the same language as the author when we're taking notes, which isn't really our normal everyday language. So it's kind of, you have to sort of rewrite in your own language what the author is talking about, because of course this guy keeps on talking about sovereignty and almost no one I know uses that word very often. So uh, it's, it's like, I can tag this a lot and I imagine I will only go back to his book when I bump into these words. Uh, so I'm having to try to think of other definitions for how I want to consider those kind of things like freedom or liberty or something like that. You know, you don't just walk around saying sovereign, sovereignty. That's not in your over it. Mm. Yes. Mm, my own sovereignty. I don't uh, think I've ever used that word. You don't? We'll say it right now. You can do it. Sovereignty. Wow. Good job. Oh. Oh. So there's a, there is a <laughs> word. 
Go Danielle. <laughs> so proud of you. I'm a pie guy. <laughs> I'm a pie guy. <laughs> uh, you're saying, writer. <laughs> There's a oh, group. There. There's a, it was a political movement that was, I don't know, started by like a former grand wizard of the KKK or something. It was a sovereign citizens movement and it was related to posse comitatus. And I did some research on this a couple of years ago and actually made a couple of art pieces about it. But it, there is a sovereign citizens movement. And the idea is that you can somehow not be a citizen of the United States because you never agreed to that you just happen to be born here and the u.s is profiting off of you and as a matter of fact the u.s government owes you seventy two thousand dollars because of you know you're going to turn in your social security number and reclaim the money that america's gdp grew whenever you were born and so it's this <laughs> weird it's interesting thing concept yeah yeah is uh is is very bizarre and shaky and of course people try it and they go into a court and they're like, I don't respect your authority. And the court's like, okay, that's fine. We're just going to go ahead and put you in jail. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Respect my authority. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yesterday uh, when we were talking a little bit about the Zettelkasten method, we talked a little bit about Rome Research, which has come up many times on our show, digital note-taking software um, that we use and highly recommend. Um, and Danielle and I actually, uh, uh, yesterday during the day, she was like, man, I wish I just took more, you know, you wrote down even more of my life. And I was like, Danielle, you need to use Rome a little more. Just lean into it. Yeah. So I need to start. I'm going to take a look at uh, Reed's Rome process today and probably try out a new schedule of journaling in Rome for my day. So we'll see. Yeah, it's been an interesting thing because, you know, one of the things Danielle looks at as a writer is word count. And sometimes I'll look back at the end of the day and I'll be like, dang, I wrote like I don't know, a couple thousand words today. And I mean, sure, it's not like all like in a story or whatever, but it, it is. It's the story of my life. It's just the word sovereign over and over Sovereign again. over and over again, <laughs> yeah. All work, no play makes read a dull sovereign. Uh, you know, every third episode, I remember that we have sound effects, so mm -hmm. I have to throw them in there, you know. Um, so we talked about Zettelkasten. We talked a little bit about Rome Research. We also talked about the concept of an evergreen note, um, and that's kind of similar to the way Ryder was talking about maybe the word um, loyalty. So maybe you start out, you find out what, something about loyalty when you're thinking about dogs, but then you create this note that's called loyalty and you come over time um, to add things that have to do with loyalty to that page. And so maybe one day you're reading about, I don't know, castles and knights and things like that. And you write something about loyalty that. Fealty. Then, yeah, there you go. There's Fealty. A fancy word. There's another word I've never probably used. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we should have a medieval uh, week one time <laughs> Or we just all talk in that way or, and dress um, up. And well, is it going to be medieval or Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Por que no los dos? You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I probably need to watch that movie, actually. I've never seen that. I've, what? I can quote a lot of things, but just because other people Okay, say stop right, the live stream right now. <laughs> put it on. <laughs> Do a group watch on the channel. There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah I like that idea. <laughs> um, so with the with Evergreen Notes, you continue to add. So you, you had that medieval thing. You add those notes about loyalty. And then maybe weeks, months, years later, you come back you have some other trigger maybe you learn something about marriage and relationships and you add it to that page and then over time you develop this evergreen you know just like evergreen tree it's always green uh this page of knowledge and and you get to see how your thoughts and information have uh, shifted and and developed on that over time so it's just a really cool concept so we could talk about that even more so uh, we did actually for about an hour yesterday. You guys can go check that out, episode 71. And with that, let's go ahead and get into our intro. <laughs> Helpful for life. Welcome to What the Hell is Water. I'm Reed Garcia, founder and CEO of Helpful for Life. I'm Danielle Garcia, his wife. I'm Ryder Richards, his friend. <laughs> and this is the show where everyone only can talk about themselves in relation to me. So, 
Uh, with that being said, um, I, I, today is, uh, has been a fun one. We've had, uh, rescheduled and changed what the topic was going to be about four times behind the scenes, uh, up until literally about two minutes before we went live. Uh, I uh, was moving cameras around and then I was like, wait, that's not what we're doing anymore. Um, but we ended up settling on a topic that we've needed to have for a while now. Um, and that is a little bit more of a deep dive into Ryder and who he is, some of his work and, um, you know, why the heck is he even on this show? And what, why is he spending time with us, right? Because uh, big spoiler alert for all of you guys, uh, Ryder's not on the payroll. <laughs> you know, Ryder is here out of the kindness of his heart. Uh, and we're now on episode 72. And so why would one, and we're, I'm just going to go ahead and ask a question to, to you, Ryder. Yeah. Why would you spend 72 uh, plus hours, let's be real, it's more like probably double that, uh, maybe even triple that uh, at this point. Uh, why would you spend all this time for some random dude you met in a sushi shop uh, said, hey, come be on my internet TV show. I know we just met and we've hung out twice. Um, why, why are you here? <laughs> uh, really, I'm really lonely. And, uh, <laughs> just uh, Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, so I think one of the things, whenever I originally bumped into Reed, we had some fun conversations, of course. And then it was kind of this idea of, I've been running my own podcast, but there is something that was sort of missing, I think, from it, which was the sort of communal and social aspect. And so uh, that's part of it. The other part is wanting to see what Reed would do. Um, it was kind of like a, a, another fun adventure to take. So uh, there's, there's a couple things there. Um, I tend to work pretty well in collaborations. I work fine alone, but I like collaborating with people. So this ended up sort of becoming, it seemed to me like a next step. Like if you're going to podcast and make art and do all these things, but you're going to do it all alone. Well, that just seems like a lonely life. So I was trying to, in an interesting way, sort of combine um, work and socialization. And this just showed up out of the blue and was perfect. Yeah, and that's kind of been a lot of how Danielle and my journey has gone too, you know, so it's funny because when you start doing things and you start moving in a direction, and a word Danielle likes to say a lot is uh, manifesting, right? What is manifesting, Danielle? Oh, man. I can define it if you'd like. but <laughs> Well, I mean, basically, I, I think of it like you decide on a change that you want to bring about in your life, and then you start speaking it out loud to people and actually taking action and making changes in your everyday life to bring about that change or make it the most likely to happen because you're doing everything in your power to make it happen. Yeah, and one of the things about manifesting is people underestimate the power of just putting something out there into the universe um, and saying like, hey, this is my intention. This is what I'm going to do. And the reality is a lot of people are too scared to do that sometimes because they're so afraid of failing. They're so afraid of what might happen. Um, and it it's tough. Um, it, it can be very difficult. Um, but however, one of the things that has been a pleasant surprise to me is the more that I just kind of said like, Hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm trying to do. And the more people I told that to, the more I got surprised where I'm like, wow, this person has been in my life this entire time. Like I know them very well, but now that I told them I'm trying to do this thing, they're telling me some stuff from their history or some people they know or whatever that I never knew about. And Oh, by the way, it can help me get to where I'm trying to go. Um, and so by doing this, manifesting and saying, Hey, like I'm looking to take the next step in my, you know, whether it be my podcasting, my art, I, I don't know exactly what's next for me. You know, I'm, I'm happy with the things that I've done up to this point, but I'm looking for the next thing that's hopefully bigger and better and greater. Um, and sometimes you just got to try something. And if there's one thing that I bet writer you can relate to is, uh, especially being in the art world for most of your life, you got to take a bunch of, of risks and spend a bunch of time up front and then see what pays out. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, I, I don't know if anyone's read, uh, Steve Martin's born standing up where he talks about doing stand up comedy, but one of the really funny kind of, or one of the things about that is that you get up there and you bomb quite often, you know, you're trying out your new material and over time you start developing kind of a sensibility of what works and what doesn't work. But 
you know, when you're an artist and you're doing exhibitions, you may, most artists have maybe one exhibition, sort of one solo show every two years. And you might have lots of little group exhibitions or jury shows along the way. And so, you know, you're not getting a ton of time in front of people. So you're spending a lot of time making your own work. And then it's like, how do you end up developing that sensibility and having that conversation? You got to be putting the ideas out there. You got to be seeing what happens with them. You got to be seeing how people react to them. Uh, and then there's the unfortunate aspect of, you know, sometimes like, you know, for instance, your mom is going to be a little bit biased. I love anything you do. Right? <laughs> so, hi, mom. so it's like, you, <laughs> I know. Hi. Uh, so, you know, there, which is great because you also need that support. But there is this other kind of side of, yeah, uh, what happens whenever it does get more critical? Like what happens with your ideas? What happens when you get some pushback? Do you change or shift from that? Or do you stay the course knowing that you're onto something valuable? Um, these are all kind of like fun ideas. And, and with the art world, this, this can happen. You can book more shows and you can do these changes more frequently if you want to. Um, I've, I've done several shows. Several, I've had up to four solo sh shows in a year before, which is just pretty taxing because each one of them that I do is a completely different body of work. I don't just keep showing the same work over and over again. I kind of take each show as an opportunity to try out something new. And so that means it's exciting for me. The audience probably doesn't know exactly what they're going to get. And um, it, it's also not great for marketing. Like if I really want to market Hold on a second. Did you work. just describe our, our show to a T? Yeah. That's, <laughs> hey. that's another reason that I'm here. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. It's great for me. And it's not good for marketing. I think we've nailed all of those so <laughs> yeah, far. 72 episodes in. Bam. You heard it here first. <laughs> Ladies and yeah, gentlemen. This, you would think I would want to try something new. But no, I just like sitting here. <laughs> you know <laughs> See, more sound effects. What is a live stream podcast, but just a daily art exhibition? Hey, there you go. There we, we always go. wanted to yeah. be an exhibitionist. Wait. I <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh. Uh, well, hey, I wanted to show this quote because this was, uh, uh, I actually would, so speaking of putting things out there into the world, right? One of the things that I put out there into the world a, uh, a while back was, um, I guess real quick, let me give the backstory before showing the quote. Um, which is I, uh, I put out into the world that I was going to do some sort of consulting. And, and I was, we had Thomas uh, Lightfoot on the first week we did this show. So I think it was episode four. Mm -hmm. um, it was a Friday. Um, and, oh, by the way, that he also performed live music for us. That was our, f our first live music guest, which is something that um, we're looking to incorporate more going forward. But just due to things being crazy and planning, we haven't, haven't made that happen again yet, honestly. So, um, but it's a really cool episode. We, um, it would give a little bit more backstory about how I got into it. But long story short, I started a consulting business, and Thomas was my first client. And uh, I was in a meeting with him this Wednesday – talking with him about um, pro uh, managing the things he's working on, things like that. And he had this quote on his dashboard as inspiration. And I feel like it was very fitting. Um, so it says, it's by Theodore Roosevelt, and one name for it, it's part of a speech, um, is the man in the arena. Um, it's, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong, how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never, those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And I just thought that was a, a very powerful quote. Um, and I, I mean, the, the overall message of it in, in a sentence is like, hey, get in the arena and do something and put yourself out there. And I feel like, writer, if, if there's someone who's put themselves out there over and over again, I, I think it's probably you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put myself out there. Uh, the, the funny thing about it too, is you 
try not do it in a way that's um, narcissistic completely or self-serving completely, right? Because there's a way of putting yourself out there that includes nothing but selfies, you know? And it's like, no, no, let's have uh, some sort of conversation or engage in something here. Um, so an ussy instead. What was that? An ussy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Much more into the ussy. From selfies to ussies. That's what 22 is all about, people. We need to move from selfies to ussies. <laughs> So, yeah, that's one of the aspects. Well, becoming an artist, you know you're going to have to exhibit your art at some point. Uh, the interesting difference between the podcast and the art thing is that with the po- with the art, I can spend my time alone making the object, so to say, or whatever it is. Um, I can plan, I can think, I can process. And then all of a sudden you're like, ta-da, look, thing. And you put it out there for the world to see. Um, you can do that as well with the podcast, but like for this podcast, you're just live and these things are coming out. You don't have time to sort of, uh, pre-build everything. And so there's a kind of a difference there that is much more putting yourself out there. So it's trying out something in real time, being a real person. And that's much more risky than the sort of shaping everything in the background and then delivering uh, delivering up something. And so I'm kind of interested in that too. It's one of the reasons why I think this podcast is a good idea. It's what can you do live? What could you do in front of people? I've done art talks before where I've shown up and have done an art talk and prepared and then thought the art talk was great. And then somebody in the audience is like, yeah, but, and then they just launch into something and you're just like, okay, how are you going to handle this live? Uh, the real pressure is handling it now here in the moment. And, and that's a different kind of pressure and tension. And it requires almost like a different set of skills and muscles uh, to grow that and to be able to navigate those things and talk about being in the arena. There is an aspect of just delivering up your art without saying anything, having it in a gallery or something, and then not engaging with anybody. And then there's this other side where you really jump into the conversation and you let people take swings at you. Uh, and that's not fun. I don't, I think if we want to avoid discomfort, It's not easy to jump in there and get swung at, but I also think it's um, maybe vital if the conversation is worth having to go ahead and put yourself out there, maybe take a couple hits and just see what happens. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of who or where I heard this. So this is probably completely misattributed, but it it may be correct. Who knows? Um, I think it might've been John Green, the author of The Fault in Our Stars, and uh, he has done a lot of other things as well, but that might be what he's most famous for. Um, And he was saying how he doesn't, or whoever this person was, right? They they didn't write something in their book that they could not stand on stage and defend. And again, Mm -hmm. probably not him, so forget who I even said that. Just in case the internet warriors are out there and they happen to find that for me, um, let me know. But the, the same kind of concept you're talking about, right? Or like, oh, you create some art. And in this case, this person was a, a, an author. And so they wrote something. Oh, no. You know who it was? I think it might have been David Sedaris. Yeah, ah. that makes a lot more sense because that's what he does. Is he go, David Sedaris is a, a humorist. He writes essays um, and then he goes around and he reads them um, at, at, at live places. And then people probably talk to him and who probably yell stuff out at him, all these types of things. And um and yeah, he was saying how he never put something down in his essay that he wouldn't be willing to um, talk about uh, in the live show because he knows people are going to come up and poke and prod and ask questions. And he wants to be able to defend that live and, and know like what his real things are, right? Yeah. And, you know, one of the interesting things there is, of course, he's well known because he sort of pushes some boundaries with what he's doing. Um I don't even think so in a, like in, in a negative sense. It's just that he's mining a lot of biography and stuff and a lot of his writing. And so one of the things there is there's other people involved and then that makes it kind of more difficult. There is a side of art and I'm sure it's the same with podcasting and other things where you just, you know what the audience wants and you just keep feeding it to them. So you're really not in the arena taking on a challenge. It's more like you're, you're in the pew and you're singing along. And so I, I'm kind of interested in that as well. Um, I don't, there's, it's not really a problem to do that, but it's also, you don't then get to stand up and talk about how brave you are is one of my thoughts. Well, that's, that's, um, you know, kind of the struggle of being a 
content creator today, which is kind of the, and I'm using air quotes here, because content creator is kind of the, a blanket term for people who create content on the internet. Um, and that's the thing is, uh, because we live in an algorithm run world, um, you have to think a little bit about what people will think or what people will click on or what the headline is or something like that. Another thing about that Teddy Roosevelt quote that I wanted to point out was, this wasn't um, some thing that was uh, broadcast all over the place. This was back in the day um, where uh, there wasn't live streaming things, right? He gave this yeah. speech uh, somewhere in France, uh, and then people were so – and it was actually – I don't even know if it <laughs> – I looked up the uh, – <laughs> Let me finish an actual sentence. How about we start with that one? <laughs> I'm going to share the, the article that I read about this story about this uh, quote in a little bit. Um, but the thing is, is that after he gave this speech, uh, people went and they printed pamphlets of it. And it got distributed all across France and actually all across Europe. And that I don't know that that was his intention, uh, you know, when he gave the talk. But it was a, a byproduct of like, hey, somebody did something, somebody made a difference, somebody inspired, somebody moved. Um, and one of the things they said in the article was like, and now here we are, you know, 150 years later or 100 years, however long it is. I don't remember what years he was president. Sorry. Um, um, that's the thing about doing live, you know, uh, <laughs> is uh, he is these things these words are still being said and it was like this person gave that speech before this world series and they, this person uh miley cyrus has some, something about him to tattooed on her ass you know and it's like <laughs> and now this person has had these ripples throughout history and and, and arguably had an effect on people um going on, going forward for a very long time and they lived in an age where that was even before expectation and now we're in this age where you know, I can press a couple buttons and I could be streaming to millions of people um, if they just show up. Where are you people? Come here, please. We need yeah. you. <laughs> well, of course, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt was also the president, right? So you end up with this platform and then whatever you say or do is amplified due to the platform and the role that you are in. And so there's a, there's a lot of responsibility there and everything else. And so uh, what it, what is also kind of funny today is... I think if you got the right person or maybe it's the wrong person to read that quote, they would deconstruct it, rip it apart, uh, toxic masculinity, blah, 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 right? This could be this, I can't believe you're trying to take on the world and just a classic imperialist male egocentric point of view. And you could very easily rip this thing apart. Uh, so there is something that we're in a time period where if we are trying to avoid discomfort, then these kind of notions of greatness and battle, um, some of them have shifted into social movements and other people are just avoiding them all together. And that's kind of interesting too, because we're also in a time period where we talk a lot more about mental health. And when you're engaging in these battles, these battles create stress and anxiety, and that can be crippling or debilitating. Uh, some people go step into the arena and get hit so hard by a bunch of internet trolls that they're just like, I'm out. And so that's another interesting thing. I'm, I mean, I know Teddy Roosevelt had his detractors. So, I, you know, I don't know how you put up with that, but that sort of resilience. I remember re hearing something like Lincoln ran for office like 64 times or something before wow. he became president. Like it was some and ridiculous he a hat number. And it was all about marketing. And once he had <laughs> the hat, all... <laughs> he had the brand well, to work with. Yeah. Well, there's also, uh, I remember reading about these debates they would have that would go on for two to three days straight. Like we're talking four to eight hour debates and people would just show up with their picnic basket and sit there all day listening to a debate. And I'm just like, I think now our attention span is at about, you know, 2.8 seconds. Uh, the idea that you could sit there and these people could keep in mind the arguments of their opponent, opponent and speak for four hours about something. And then the other opponent would then have a chance to rebut and the rebuttal might take six hours. And right. it was these kind of interesting time frames and the idea that you could not just, I mean, a lot of people can talk for six hours straight. That's not it. But like having an intelligent, articulate kind of framed out conversation, having the oratory skills to keep people captivated the entire time, man, that's something that's a, that's kind of a lost art. Yeah. And you heard it here first. Ryder has now just signed up for us to do the first 24 hour live stream where we do exactly that. Just talk. <laughs> Just talk. 
and have I've... very, very dense conversations the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound tiring at all does it no no not exhausting i'm gonna have to start doing a workout attach some little weights to my I jaw <laughs> <laughs> hour 12 they brought in the rubber bands to help, help bring it back up <laughs> just like drool coming out <laughs> yeah well i i thought it was funny that uh teddy came up again because that was just the other day on the show i mentioned the quote uh speak softly and carry a big stick um, which I believe I said, I think is Roosevelt. And you know what? I actually was right on that one. We got Roosevelt oh. right there. Uh, so here's a, for those who are audio only, we're showing a, a Wikipedia picture, um, which is William Allen Rogers, 1904 cartoon, where it recreates an episode in Gulliver's Travels. And it's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt uh, cartoon, and he's carrying a big stick. And it literally says big stick written on it, just for extra clarity. <laughs> uh, and and he's walking uh, around the Caribbean Sea. And, you know, I, I'm not familiar enough with the history off the top of my head um, to speak much on his policy, but I wanted to tie those things together and also point out that uh, he was around in uh, – or about a hundred years ago. So I was spot on with that. So wait, well where's done, my, Reed. Where's my sound effect? Uh, oh yeah, there we go. Thank you, thank you. I'm here till Thursday. Well, writer, um, I know we've done this before, a, a, a time or two on the show, but every time it's a little bit different. And so I wanted to mm -hmm. make sure to ask today, especially since you know we are diving a little deeper on you today. Um, give us a couple, a couple minute uh, story of how you got to where you are today and make sure you mention, you know, any URLs that are, are pertinent as you're, you know, you're doing that. I, we've got no shame in our plugs here unless they're butt plugs. And then we definitely don't have shame. <laughs> hey, here's my collection. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Uh, the best URL is probably writerrichards.com because that can point you other directions. And uh, so I've done a couple of different projects. Um, easiest way to sort of walk through the history is that I grew up in New Mexico, moved to Texas, uh, hopped schools for a little while until I ended up with an art degree, I taught college for a little while, ran some art galleries for a little while. And the art galleries are both in Lubbock and in Dallas. And then um, at some point back when I was in Lubbock, I started this nomadic gallery, which is a truck gallery that I ran with a couple buddies of mine and that we drove to several states and would have lots of exhibitions in this truck gallery. And that was kind of fun. Um, after that, what did we do? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting zoned out. I'm having to stare at my own face. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I definitely do that sometimes too. <laughs> I just want to point out that I think it's funny that, you know, again, like, we met and we chatted and then we brought you on the show. And then later on, I figured out that you lived a bit of a nomadic life driving around in a truck. And, you know, we did the RV thing. I'm like, hey, yeah. I didn't know we had that thing in common. Yeah, it syncs up. And uh, yeah, and somewhere along there, I had another friend who was like, hey, I like what y'all are doing, but I live in Pennsylvania. Let's form like a collective where we can have several people participating and be nationwide rather than this kind of geographically bound thing. And so uh, we... We started another collective, ended up with about 14 people in it. And at the time, I'm still curating and writing about art. And real real quick, though, shows. define what a collective is for people who aren't familiar mm. with that. So uh, there's lots of different sort of art phrases for this. But when you join a group of people together under sort of a single umbrella or purpose, and the gallery at this point, a gallery, could just say, hey, uh, or you could approach them and say, I've got 14 people. We're operating under this premise. And it's kind of like an umbrella. It's almost like a company of artists or a troupe. And you just sort of, you can, uh, we would actually frame up our shows under a concept. The concept might be to have a famous art critic come up with a sentence. We'd say something like, well, there's 14 of us in the group come up with a 14 word sentence. And then this was one of the, we've had a couple shows like this. And then they'd come up with a sentence and each one of us gets a word. And then you make the art about the word. And then you would line the work up in the gallery that way. Every individual still gets to be a complete individual and make their own kind of work. They just have a different prompt. And so you get to see their different reactions to the prompts. And that makes for kind of a, a visual show that links together not only a famous critic, but then each of us kind of get to ride the coattails of the fame of that person while building our own fame. And the shows are just sort of strange and interesting, but they're conceptually linked. And so there were projects like that that we were doing that were a lot of fun. 
and and that's uh all of that was i guess 2010 ish you know somewhere in this range uh the truck gallery is a little before that the um other stuff ran a little bit longer and then at some point i started doing my own arts writing blog um which wasn't really a blog it was critical reviews that were all 100 words or less so is that i still ended up? up what was that is that still online yeah it's uh, called utopia.us but the utopia is spelled with an e in the front so um, which is t-o-p-i-a.com that's it uh i think it might be dot us oh dot us you said okay yeah, yeah. And, and you can link to that from writerrichards.com. But yeah, ended up at some point having about 40 people uh, write for me over the course of about seven years. So I had a lot of people writing for that publication. And, and it was most of it was just them wanting to write about a show because they loved the show and were passionate about it. But also this idea of turning an art review into 100 words, it was like, well, everyone's got time to read 100 words. But you could make that 100 words really poetic or really dense, or you could maybe only really fit like two concepts in there. So you couldn't just ramble on and on. Uh, and so this was a fun project to run. So I did that for a while as well. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of little things. At some point, I jumped out of teaching and becoming, a, I, I was a professor and a department chair for the last three years of my uh, academic career. And that was at Eastfield College in Dallas, and then jumped out of there and started doing this, whatever the heck this is. Uh, I'm, my day job is to be a creative director, so I do web development and graphic design and stuff like that, some some product development, and yeah, anything else that they need. Kind of a Swiss Army knife uh, for the workplace. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, writer. And you know, for our viewers at home, or maybe the first time viewers who've never seen this show before. What the hell are you doing right now? What is this show? <laughs> this show? <laughs> yes. Oh, what? As in, what the hell is? I can't. I can't do the face thing, man. You got to take me off camera. <laughs> take him off camera. <laughs> <laughs> can't stare in my own face. I like. I'm talking, but I'm looking at the camera, and it's just like, and my brain shorts out. <laughs> oh, perfectly fine. <laughs> this is a skill I'm going to have to practice. <laughs> no, it it it's it is weird staring at yourself, and you know. Pro tip for those of you at home who, if you're ever doing these Zoom calls and things like that, hide your self view. It is not normal for you to be in a meeting and always be uh, staring at yourself. There's a reason that mirrors are only in certain places, right? You don't need to be seeing yourself all the time. And guess what? Nobody else is going to be staring at you that much and judging everything you look at. And guess if they are, then why do you care? Do you really want to be associating with that person that much? Probably not. But anyways, uh, just a little real moment for you guys here because that's the thing here about being a live show is Ryder gets to tell us how not only all of you at home don't like staring at his face, but also he doesn't like staring at his face. So that's why we also have an audio-only version for you guys. <laughs> you don't have to listen to the video or watch the video. Uh, but yeah, Ryder, so if I were to say to you, like, if you were going to tell one of your friends, like, what is this show that you're doing? What, how would you describe it to him? Yeah, the, the podcast that I'm doing now is called Let Us Think About It. And and it's it's sort of philosophical ramblings. It's a way for me to take ideas that are in my head and get them out into the world. It's also a way for me to take books and concepts and start sort of mapping out, I think, a path or a journey into sort of a richer, more considered life. And so whenever I talk about philosophy, that's kind of what I talk about is I can bring up ideas, which are frameworks or tools in which help us look at the world in a different way. There's also some sociologists out there who have pointed out some sort of tremendous problems that we're encountering. And they have done this like back in the eighties, they have predicted all the things that are going to happen now because they saw these things showing up. And yet we're not seeing sort of any changes that are happening. We're just seeing certain situations in the workplace and whatever else getting worse over time. And so I'm really interested in these things, this idea that there might be a better way to live, there might be a better way to shape a society and trying to work at, you know, understanding those and also understanding the sort of common sense logic that is oftentimes tripping us up from getting to that place, uh, which comes back to being humans and being emotional and getting things stuck in our head and then fighting for them and then realizing, Maybe we shouldn't have been fighting for that. Like, you know, that's it's also sort of a, a common thing that humans do is 
They can uh, get divided up by their identities or by some small association and start claiming that is ultimately profound and then causing a whole lot of ripple effects that can be quite negative. And so I'm sort of interested in that. Uh, that's why I'm reading a, another book called Identity and Violence. Um, it's all sort of about how we tend to over-index on one aspect of our identity. And this generates kind of a, a fundamental flaw in which we uh, can gravitate towards violence because we feel that our identity is threatened when you threaten that one aspect of our identity. Yet most of us have a pluralism of identities, a multiplicity of identities where, you know, we aren't just one thing or two things. We're about 50 things. And so you don't need to put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Yeah. And just real quick, because, you know, it's it's here and it's happening. We've got to show you guys a quick little Lincoln cam. <gasps> Hey, oh, like, give him some pets. Oh, say hey, buddy. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, look, he says, oh, I'm so cute. Oh, He's come and look at me. Yes. Uh, it, it, every now and then you got to have a little refresh because we've got the writer cam up close, you know. And then you're like, oh, there he is. And he's got to stare at his face this whole time while he's doing it. And, you know, and then other times you're like, oh, maybe we should get back to the puppers. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, wait. I, well, I don't know every... if I pushed that. Hold on. <laughs> Let me go. There's this. And then there's that. There we go. Ah, there's a <laughs> <laughs> They're both very similar, but also very different. Uh, no, I just wanted to point out for those of you who are aware, Ryder is actually traveling right now and on screen now a couple of days in a row. He has showed us two separate paperback books that he has chosen to travel with. So, you know, that tells you at least a little bit of something about him. He uh, likes to, to read and learn. And um, if there's one thing that I'm aware that Ryder does, it's uh, consume valuable information right I, I i don't know what your number was and maybe you do how many podcasts and books you you consumed last year oh yeah i didn't get through all the pot i didn't end up counting up all the podcasts uh but it was well over 200 maybe 250 uh it could have been more and then as far as books it, i know it's over 50 but i really didn't start counting yeah. Uh, until about halfway through the year, which is fascinating as well. Um, so yeah, I consume physical books and of course, audio books. And sometimes with the audio books, I take notes. Sometimes I don't. Um, if it's a really good audio book, I buy the physical book and then I reread it. Uh, so there's oftentimes I'm a pretty slow reader, actually. I, I take a lot of time and it might take me, I can spend 20 minutes on one page it just sort of depends on what I'm reading. And there's other books that I can just blow through very sure. quickly. <laughs> and so. to, to be to give some context, right? Like it's one thing to be reading like a page turning like fiction story or even a nonfiction story. It's another thing to be reading like dense philosophical text that you have to decode all of the terminology and all of that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and plug it because we're going to have this conversation one day about whether or not you should read via paperback, via uh, e-reader, via uh, your phone, uh, audiobook. We'll talk about all of the pros and cons of each of those methods and how it's been for us and how we've used those because I think that's a conversation we definitely should have. And I think we might maybe invite oh, one or two people from the Rome Research Book Club to have that conversation with us too because uh, we've had a little bit of that conversation and some people are pretty strong strongly opinionated on which way is the they best really are yeah <laughs> it, it's so funny everyone's like well i know you think this works for you but it's just because you haven't tried my method yet my <laughs> method is better <laughs> yes and I, I i think it's uh quite quite fun um well so writer so you you have a great storied history there you've done a bunch of related but unrelated things and one thing that you didn't mention too much about but i want to bring up was kind of the diy aspect of your life mm. when did that start to come into your into play yeah i think that was uh po like post college i like i did do some carpentry work in high school and college and then sort of took off and just started doing whatever i wanted and you know as i got through college but um i when i moved back to lubbock at some point and had started an art gallery then there, you're required, you know, just I needed to turn it into a nice white cube so that the things would look good. At the same time, I bought um, a $40,000 house and flipped it. And so 
uh, just meant that I had to spend, you know, basically six months of my life breaking my back so that I could then make some money off this house and learned a lot along the way and was doing almost all the work myself. And then I did something similar on a second house and over time just started developing these skills between the gallery and the home flipping. And now all of a sudden it's just like, uh, I don't know, it's a skill set that I have. I'm, I pick things up pretty quick, so it's not all that difficult. I understand the concepts of how the, you know, electricity works and plumbing works and all this. And so there is kind of things that I don't want to mess with. Um, I, I don't want to burn a house down, so I don't really <laughs> want to mess with the electric, but I can. And, and so, yeah, the, the DIY aspect comes out of just sort of being handy and self-sufficient, but, uh, it started move creeping into my art practice somewhere around 2014 and i started doing artwork that was about the invisible labor that goes on in the art world which was typically involved building a wall or something like that and uh, inside the gallery and then sheet rocking it paint mudding it painting it and then when people walked in they didn't even notice that there was anything there and this sort of being a commentary about Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand and how economic systems work and how there's all this invisible labor and effort that goes in, but we don't see it. So there's sort of a, um, an, in architecture, there is a lot of burnt up energy and time that is built to be unseen. And so there's a certain sort of violence that happens to a certain class of people that create things that are only supposed to become invisible. So I started talking about some of those things which was interesting timing because just a couple years later, Trump gets elected as president and there was sort of a, um, you know, a populist uprising. And a lot of that was working class people that did not have college degrees was some of the primary people in his voting camp. And so I was sort of working around those notions at that time of this being sort of an underprivileged class that was not being considered or thought of and being blocked off for becoming invisible. And so, of course, I was talking about it in kind of academic language, but I sort of saw that movement coming and thought that was a fascinating thing and was making work about it. And then when it actually did happen, then I was like, oh, OK, well, you know, now what is left to say? What is left to talk about? Um, and so I started talking a lot about how DIY works with capitalism as a form of empowerment and how people feel empowered, yet we're still sort of highly reliant on these systems. And the other idea is where are you getting the desires that you have, right? If you want to have a better bathroom, where is that desire coming from? So you are gonna remodel your bathroom. Well, why and what for and what is the purpose? And people like to kind of couch it under the idea that they're somehow going to be making their place look better so they can resell it in the future. Almost all DIYers talk about the return on investment like how much money they save and right. how they did all this work themselves. And then they end up with a kind of mediocre result because they're not a professional, but they're really proud of it. And then and they I also, is, you know, maybe discount uh, the fact that they should be effectively charging a, an hourly rate for themselves. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it sort of all falls into this kind of hobbyist realm of fixing things, but you needed to have an excuse for it and it needs to be an economic excuse. And I find all that to just sort of be fascinating. So whenever I started doing the DIY work, a lot of it is sort of centered around these ideas of self and how you find yourself and why you crave the things that you crave. And the idea that I want to build something, I want to create something and better the world, but like, how am I gonna do that? Oh, I'm gonna yeah. rebuild my kitchen. I'm gonna build a deck onto my house. I'm gonna, you know, do these creative, you know, big projects and spend a lot of money on them. And they claim that it's gonna increase the value of my property. Uh, you know, and I'm just thinking like, I think you're harnessing a different set of desires and then just kind of papering over it. Well, it's an interesting thing, right? DIY, because um, it's one thing to create something or do something or build something yourself. Um, and you, I mean, if you've not done that before, I highly encourage you to do something like that because there's such a good feeling that comes with that. It's like, I don't care that this isn't just right or it's not as pretty or it's not as perfect or whatever. I made that. And not only did I made that, but I can remember all of the time that I spent doing that thing, right? That was for me. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say that one, it's one thing to create and do something, but it's another thing to do something in the physical world. I think there's just something mm -hmm. different about dealing with something in 3D space, um, dealing with physical objects. And whenever we got into the RV, 
that was when that kind of first really clicked for me because I never did shop in in uh, college or high school or whatever because I had to make sure to get all of the highest grades so I could get to the biggest school. And guess what? Shop only gave me a, a GPA of 4.0, whereas other classes I could get a 5.0 or 6.0. So I was actually disincentivized to take things like theater and mm -hmm. uh, music and uh, and um DIY stuff with the probably shop. art yeah, yeah. welding mm -hmm. things like that art yeah. exactly I've, you know, I've, all I haven't taken an art that... class since elementary school how sad is that you know what's funny too about this is colleges originally started as liberal arts colleges and what's so fascinating now is to think of them as becoming technical vocation schools uh there has been a trend with the marketplace in general that people want to come out getting jobs so they want to be technically trained so they'll go get like a master's degree and expect to walk out with a job. But it's kind of like originally colleges were made so that you could learn how to think about different things. And there weren't even degrees. And what's so fascinating now is that we consider it like stops. Like you will pursue these actions, you will get this, and then you will get X in return. You so we've turned it transactional. First, right? and... Yeah, yeah. We've turned the whole thing into a, a gaming, a game system, a transactional system with certifications and credentials and money behind it. And this is a very, this is another huge problem that we're facing in America when people think that because they move through this system, they're going to end up getting everything they want um, because you're checking the boxes. But there's a lot of life that is not about checking these boxes. And, you know, keeping that in mind is difficult. Well, and there's also, you know, we won't dive into this rabbit hole, but it's also from the company perspective as they're trying to hire people, a lot of times these are boxes that they require you to check, even though mm -hmm. realistically speaking, a lot of times you don't need that box. And sometimes that's a college degree. Um, sometimes that's a higher level college degree. Sometimes that's some sort of, oh, you must have had X number of years of leadership for this entry level leadership position. And it's kind of like, well, how am I supposed to do that if yeah. I can't, you know? The, uh, and so I think there's gonna be a shift and an adjustment as companies start to realize and recognize people okay, maybe the formal education is only one part of it, and maybe that's one of the boxes, um, but there's going to be other ways where it's like, hey, here are my skills, and here are the things that I can, I've created, and I can show you all the things. And I actually was just talking with a friend yesterday about how, you know, I was like, oh, he just got a new job. I'm like, oh, did you end up having to show him your resume? He's like, no, actually, I just did the thing. And they're like, yeah, you're good. You can have the job. And I was like, <laughs> that's yeah. actually really cool. I like that a lot. Uh, but then there's the, the reality of, okay, well, how do you process hundreds or thousands of applicants in a way without dehumanizing them and turning them into numbers. So it's not an easy answer, right? And that's why I said we're not go down mm -hmm. that rabbit hole. Um, but I wanted to bring up a couple of those things. Um, well, speaking of checking boxes, I have to go to a dermatologist appointment. So here's your plug to go get your moles checked if you've never been checked for skin cancer. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. That's a very good plug. Thank Box you very check. much, Danielle. <laughs> and since we're here, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention that um, in case I haven't said it before on the show, even if I have, I actually have had melanoma, um, and I had, which is a form of skin cancer. And I had uh, never gone to the dermatologist before because I didn't have bad acne. I didn't have dry skin. I didn't have really any skin issues uh, that I needed. And uh, my mom was very uh, you know, she she grew up in the baby oil age <laughs> where you oiled up and tanned and uh, all that kind of stuff. And so she was a smart cookie or still is a smart cookie. And she put sunscreen on me all the time. Um, and so, sure, I had a couple of times where, you know, I burned too much and I peeled and things like that from going to the beach or whatever. Uh, but on the whole, I'm pretty good about wearing my sunscreen. And I also learned a little bit about melanoma where it's not just sun exposure. There's a lot of different causes. So. If you guys haven't been to the dermatologist, go get checked because if you find it early, they literally take it off. They take your mole off in the office, and that's all you have to do. Um, but if you catch it too late, it starts to go deeper into your skin, gets into your body, starts to spread everywhere, and it can end up killing you very quickly. Um, so just a little fun pick-me-up as Danielle heads off to the dermatologist. Um, but back to DIY writer. Um, yeah. I, I have it pulled up. I don't know if you want me to, to show it or not, but you, you you have a little book that you've made called The Will to DIY. Oh. Would you like me to show yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Sure, show that. Yeah. I'm still working on the uh, the site and everything else. Um, so Oops. Wrong place to scroll, sorry. It's all right. So what is this book? Uh, the This is some of the ideas that I was just talking about with some of the philosophy, but the book... And, and the one thing that I need to do for it is write an introduction that's uh, very much kind of the thing that I'm about to talk about. 
it's framed up under uh, following some philosophers. So it starts out with Nietzsche and sort of riffs on his thus spoke Zarathustra. But the idea is that instead of going to the mountaintop to get knowledge and come back down to share it, then you end up sort of getting trapped in a mortgage, right? You get cat, you get sort of stuck with the idea of a fixed low interest rate and this becoming this sort of trap that we fall into. And what do you do with all your sort of rage and fury and willingness to overcome and all the battles that you want to fight? So one of the things about the book is sort of starts off from that premise that you can sort of reshape your uh, will to power into furniture or into DIY. And then I start walking through how this is a kind of a spirit of revolution and how therapy works, how estrangement works, how agency works, and all these kind of things. And I start developing charts, and these charts uh, are all references to different kind of philosophers, but the charts work through a cycle of how you can move through the world by not getting fixed at any given point, but sort of moving from the machinic into the craftsman, moving into the amateur, and then creating something that ends up in the political realm and then sort of recycling back through these kind of wheels. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff there that I'm kind of messing with and discussing sort of the political ramifications of creating uh, sort of a space for yourself in the world through this kind of proxy of do it yourself. Like it's almost like do it yourself philosophy. It's do it yourself politics. It's do it yourself thinking. It just happens to be the physical object is maybe the way that we get started. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, for those of you who want to check that out, you can go to thewilltodiy.com, um, which we'll share in the chat as well. And I just want to point out that, you know, some people are like, wait, so you're telling me that you're an art guy, you read a bunch, you, you're kind of into this philosophy thing, but you also work with your hands. And uh, the thing is, uh, I was talking with... Um, one of my friends uh, who we've had on the show earlier, Grady Hillhouse, he has a YouTube channel um, called Practical Engineering. And whenever we uh, chatted with him, um, not, sorry, let me let me start that one over. So whenever uh, I talked with him earlier this week, he was telling me about how, you know, the things we do uh, as people and as creators is we actually have kind of this unique combination of things that we've done as we've moved through the world. And yeah, some people have similarities, right? But in Grady's case, like he was the first person to present civil engineering and present construction and infrastructure in a way that uh, the average person could very easily understand and appreciate and maybe even get a little bit of interest in science and engineering because of that. Uh, and he just had an episode out uh, not too long ago, which we'll share in the chat. It was talking about foundations. Um, and mm -hmm. as I was like, Grady, this is a great one. It's so relatable to the average person, especially if they're a homeowner because they have a foundation uh, in their own house. And if it's, they've had it for any significant amount of time or the house isn't new, they're familiar with issues that can happen. There's shifting, there's cracking, the problems that can lead to the house. Um, also on the show before, um, I'm trying to remember if this was the show, but if it wasn't, we won't plug it. But if it was, I think we talked about the analogy of uh, our, ourselves as being a house and having the foundation and the walls and the roof and things like that. Um, we, we did talk about that, right, Ryder? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That sounds um, very so, familiar. Yeah. So we'll link. That's the thing about being on episode 72. I mean, that's probably back in the 20s yeah. or something. Um, so you start to start to wonder, like, wait, was that real life or live life? I don't remember. Um, but yeah, so the point I was making was Grady was saying like, Hey, that's something that we as individuals, as creators, like we get to take our unique stories and apply them and use those to teach and to share our stories. And in this case, writer has been doing that, um, for many years and it, it started off in art galleries and well, maybe not started off. It started off with a BB gun on the back of his truck, getting kicked out yeah. of high school. <laughs> as we talked about yesterday. Good times. Yeah. And then, you know, college and, uh, and many, many various art exhibits and, and professorship. And, and then it went through a, a time where you were traveling around in a, a rider truck. Wow. The irony or coincidence or whatever word makes yeah. sense there. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, yeah, and then you end up getting into the DIY, flipping houses, and now you have another house of your own and a shop where you can do all the DIY you want. And not only do you have that shop, but you were able to build that shop now after all of those decades of experience and leverage that knowledge and construction and art and design. And then you're bringing in this podcasting 
where you enjoy consuming content around philosophy, art, capitalism, history, things like this. Uh, and then you get to incorporate those into your podcast. Let us think about it. And you can now shoot that and listen to or record it in your own home studio, which is within your shop. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many people have a shop that has a studio made for live video as well as a DIY shop. And it's in their backyard, uh, and it's in Texas, and you're not the most right leaning person in the world. So you, you know you, you've you, you've came up a uh, quite the interesting person, writer. So we really appreciate you having on the show, and um, we can't say thank you enough for all of the time and effort that you've put in so far to the show. So don't leave us, please, never, <laughs> don't run away, uh, man. But well, the last thing that I wanted to ask you, uh, writer, is completely uh selfish but it also involves you so it's not totally selfish and that mm. is how would you describe what this show is what is what the hell is water if you were to tell uh somebody one of your friends um uh, if you want to picture someone in it that you in your life or whatever and say hey mm -hmm. i'm doing this new show called what the hell is water give me your pitch oh i would talk about how we're investigating topics and discussing ways to live a, a more sort of considered life. I think I said something similar about my own podcast, but it's, I think it's true for this one as well, that we're interested in sort of unpacking ideas and giving people different methodologies, <clears throat> excuse me, in which you can move through life in, in ways that are a little more insightful. You can maybe figure out that there's better or alternate ways to do something. And the range of topics that we discuss does cover all of life. Like we're not fixated on any given point. And I think that that's a, it's kind of a nice thing where we're not going for this niche that is like, we will only talk about civil engineering. Like we're, we're really saying like, this is about life. This is about how you move through it. These are about some difficult things. And here might be some examples um, where while we're both willing to learn, I would also talk about us trying to serve as sort of mentors and models of a certain kind of person who's willing to continually fail, continually engage and people can sort of, um, they can take that or leave it. And, and that's also part of the show is that, you, you know, you don't necessarily, we aren't claiming that we're right about everything. We're just pursuing these ideas. We're pursuing these notions. We're looking for what it means to have a better life. I couldn't have said it better myself and uh, appreciate you talking so much this episode. Sorry to dry your throat out a little bit. Uh, but that's the thing about what the hell is water is. As you guys heard just now, Ryder has a, a very unique background and he comes very much from the art world. And so he sees the world a certain way and he knows how things uh, are, are from a design perspective. And he's also built things with his hands and uh, also built things to support the art things, which is kind of an interesting concept in and of itself. Um, and I can't help but mention also, by the way, we not only does he have this experience, but we've already shared some of these things with you, you know, definitely plenty of mental stimulation, but also some practical things as well. We actually hung a curtain with Ryder to get a little taste of what DIY with Ryder and Reed could look like. Maybe that's our new segment title. I don't know. Um, tool time, except the guys are just tools. That's our, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and uh, yeah, so we had a time where we, we hung a curtain and not only do we hang the curtain but we talked about literally every single step it wasn't just how it wasn't just the oh here's one two three four but we talked about hey all right you got to hang it in the stud well wh how do you find a stud and where are the different studs and here's where you can find them and if you live in an apartment they might be here if you live in a home they might be here and oh by the way you make sure you consider the length make sure you consider the width and oh by the way we failed here at doing ours and so learn from our failures and and then we can help you get even better so we'll link to that episode as well um, but the point is, is we're just getting started here, uh, both with helpful for life and what the hell is water. You know, I just was telling Danielle yesterday already on this show, we've talked about sex. We've talked about religion. We've talked about so many other things and we've brought on experts on nutrition. We've brought on experts on, um, uh, relationships. We've brought on a data analyst expert who who helps us figure out, uh, how we can use data and how we can interpret data headlines how we can figure out what stats mean especially in a day and age where you got to know like things like covid like oh 15 percent chance of that five percent chance of this oh you're gonna double your risk if that like she helped us uh decode those types of things and oh by the way 
all of these people that we've talked to so far, they're people in my individual personal network. We haven't even reached out yet to people that are outside of us. And we're just getting started with this show and I'm extremely excited for where it's going to go. And the other best thing part thing, wow, words are hard today. <laughs> the the other great thing about uh the show is you, you, the audience, the thing that we want the most is to help you. I founded this company four years ago, four years ago, by the way, and it it's called Helpful for Life. Our goal is to be the best education you never got. We are trying to make your life easier. We're trying to make your life better. We're trying to make you happier. We're trying to help you have better relationships, eat better food, drink better drinks, maybe experiment with some drugs. You never know what's going to happen when you're talking with us. But the thing is, is we want to make your life better. And the best way we can help you is by you telling us what you need help with. So yeah, maybe we hung a curtain, but maybe you have a DIY project at home that you're like, man, I've been putting this off for a while. If only I knew how to do it. Right in, yeah. tell us, and we can realistically can walk you through that. And not only will that help you, but it will help other people. And that could potentially be one or two other people, or it literally could potentially be millions of people. So stop being so selfish and tell us what you want <laughs> so we can help you help others, help other people. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I was just thinking that uh, there's some projects I'm going to have coming up, hopefully in the next couple of months that include things like installing a sink putting in a toilet, things like that. Uh, so if you're curious about those things, I could have Reed come over and film me doing some of this and show you at least some Only of the fans. things that I'm considering. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Wrong. Yeah, 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 right, right. <laughs> wrong toilet yeah. show. Wrong, oh, it's a different kind of toilet show. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Uh, but yeah, there, there are some projects like that that are going to be undertaken at my place. And yeah, if you're interested, we might produce a little segment on it. Yes. So with that being said, you know, writer is a busy guy and, you know, I've got things to do as well. We could stay here all day, but I think we need to wrap it up a little bit. Um, so writer, uh, oh, you know, I started off on my tirade, but I forgot to mention that. So we have writer coming from the art and the design angle. And then we have me. I'm coming from the technical, the engineering side and the business side. You know, I may not sound like much, but I have a business minor. Hey, hey, hey. that means I did some schooling on it. And then I've also done other school uh, on top of that as well, which I won't get listed into. But I have experience in business, both from schooling and from working um, and seeing how things work in the, the big blue collar world world. And that's where, not the blue collar, white collar. Uh, and that's where I was able to make plenty of money to be able to quit um, and not work, quote unquote, as people like to say for four years. Um, and and I, now we're still able to keep going. And so by us being able to leverage the, the art side and the engineering side, that gives us a very kind of unique perspective on the world. And oh, by the way, we also happen to be white dudes who um, aren't horrible white dudes. And we're, we're very conscious about um, how we talk. And yes, we're live, so we're going to mess up. And yes, we're still learning. So we're going to hear the right terms or the right ways to say things. And oh, we're going to make tons of mistakes. But the big thing is, is it's important to us is we're going to own up to our mistakes and we're going to have uh, eventually we're going to have something basically underneath, if not every piece of content, most pieces of content we have where we say, hey, here's where we list all the things we got wrong. Here's where some people came in and said, hey, actually, you mentioned this, but here's these other things. Well, we are going to share that information with you guys so you can learn along with us. So that is the big goal for Helpful for Life and also what the hell is water. So with that, writer. You know, I think it's been a good journey for us today. Any other last thoughts? No, no, this is, uh, yeah, this has been fun sort of trip down memory lane to go like, oh, yeah, I've done a bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah. and the nice thing about um, a lot of the things that you've done, you know, is you are creating things that exist outside yourself. Like, you know, I I worked when I, uh, my main job um, before this was working at Boeing, building satellites. And that cool thing is, like, now there are satellites that are flying around that, you know, if you go fly on American Airlines and you use internet, like, I can say, hey, that internet is coming through a satellite that I worked on and through electronics mm -hmm. that I physically touched maybe in some cases, um, but definitely helped design, which is pretty cool. Um, but the cool thing about being in the art space and also now that you've been podcasting and writing is you can look back and we can go to all these links that we've now shared in the chat and you can see how these things have done and changed and developed over the years. And those are pieces that exist outside of you, which 
again, like even if you're not in this world, this is another one of the benefits of starting to record more about your own life. Like we've been talking a lot about with Rome Research is you can see what you've done in your life because sometimes at the end of the day, you feel like crap and you're like, man, this really sucks. And I actually felt like that yesterday. I'm like, I didn't do very well yesterday. I, I didn't focus on the things I needed to focus on. I got a little sidetracked working on this other thing and I felt really bad. But now I can go back and I can scroll through and I can see wow, here's all the things that I did. Here's this research I did. And yes, it wasn't, you know, maybe focused as sharply as it needed to be, but it's still useful things that I can use. And now I have forever. And oh, by the way, maybe I can help and share with other people. So there's value in recording those things outside of yourself so you can go back to them later. And oh, by the way, just recording them changes the way they are anchored within your brain. It helps that you remember them more. Uh, it changes the way you think. It changes the way you feel. Uh, and it changes the way you remember. So, um, with that being said, the, the very short recap uh, for today was writer born, writer live, writer die someday, but hopefully not for a long time. <laughs> hopefully we got a few more years. <laughs> hopefully we got a few more years. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And it's not hump day, so it's the, but it is another good day of week, which is Friday, right? Going into the weekend. So everybody have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday.